Hello everyone, my name is Austin Shaner, and welcome back to my channel. So let's talk about neck profiles. Now I haven't talked about neck profiles much on this channel because in my design, I simply use three point arcs. And many of you have reached out to me questioning whether we should be limiting ourselves to three point arcs, as that doesn't leave much room for other common profiles. And while arcs can create most neck profiles, there is truth in the fact that splines are a faster and more intuitive way to achieve the same result. However, we often leave them constrained as the dimensions required to define them are either ambiguous or irrelevant to our design. Now, a month or so ago, I made a pretty bold claim that splines are overrated, that we should almost never use them when the standard tools can achieve the same result. Now, I stand by that statement. However, after that video, I went down the rabbit hole learning how splines function under the hood of Fusion, particularly control point splines, because as it turns out, they are straight up Bezier curves. And while doing that, I came across a video by Freya Holmer called The Beauty of Bezier Curves. In that video, she does an incredible job showing us the math behind Bezier curves using beautiful animations and not sounding like a college lecture. If you haven't seen that video, I highly recommend you go watch that first, as she will give you a far better understanding of Bezier curves than I will, and admittedly in a much more entertaining way. So armed with the knowledge that control point splines are Bezier curves, this means that they are actually quite simple and elegant to constrain if you understand how they work. And no, I don't mean calculating the polynomial functions, but rather a more practical method for fusion, using just a few construction lines and a simple height dimension. So today, we are gonna cover how we can better utilize and constrain control point splines in fusion to create better neck profiles for guitars. So jumping into fusion, what you see on the screen here is a control point spline with a single control point. And this is also known as a quadratic Bezier curve. And to make this a bit easier to explain, I've gone ahead and I've dimensioned all three of these as equal to one inch. And that'll make more sense in a second why I did that. So let's talk about how these work. So if I sketch a point anywhere along this line and anywhere along this line, now this is very similar to the variable fillet method, which I showed you in the last video, where you have a start point and an end point, and anywhere along that path, there's a value. So the value at the start would be zero, and the value at the end would be one. And any point in the middle will have uh, a separate value, and this value in the math is known as t. And so because this is one inch, that's why I mentioned it one, is I could say the value here is 0.5. And that brings that point to exactly halfway along that line's trajectory. And so I could say this one is 0.5, and it brings that one along that line's trajectory. So it's pretty cool what is actually happening under the hood here, because if we draw a line connecting these two, we get a third linear interpolation. So if I draw a point here, and I dimensioned that to 0.5 of the length of this line, then effectively I'd put it at the midpoint. And now you will notice that this point right here lies exactly on the highest point of this spline, no matter how far we zoom in. And this line right here is tangent to that peak of this spline. And keep that in mind, because that's going to be very useful as we start to talk about how to dimension these. But let's visualize this a little bit further on how these work. So I'm going to add a user parameter. Now, I've already added it in here, but let me show you. I created one called t value, which will let me control both of these with one dimension. So right now, this is set to 0.5. So let's change this to 0.25, and let's add that to our dimensions. So I'm going to say that this value is this value times t value. And basically, no matter what I change this to, it will always be 0.25 of this dimension. And so I could say this one is the same thing, because remember, these need to be symmetric. So what we will do is say this one is equal to this dimension 
times t value as well. And you'll notice, let's delete this line real quick, or that point. You'll notice even at 0.25, there's a point where this line is perfectly tangent to this spline. So if I add a point, and let's not make it to the midpoint, let's just add it on here and make it coincident to our spline, like that. That is exactly the point of where this line touches our spline. And so if we go back to our user parameter, and we start to change this value. So let's change it to like 0.1. Pay attention to this point as I go through these numbers. So we'll go 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and finally we can say 1. So you'll notice that both of these dimensions have now changed to 1 because those points that were connecting those lines have reached their destination. And if I change this to zero, then these have changed to zero and you don't see any lines across. But if I go back to point five, this line now stretches from the midpoint here to the midpoint here. And this point right here, as it moves along, um, not along this path, but as it move, interpolates across this line, basically sketches as if it was a pencil, sketches out this spline. And that's exactly how these splines are generated. So if I go back to 0 0.25, or let's do 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, you'll notice that basically that is drawing out that shape. And so this is really cool to understand because what we can actually do is we can delete these dimensions. And let's delete our equal constraints here. Let's make sure we still have everything. And let's make this horizontal. So basically, as long as this is horizontal, and these are midpoints to these lines, let's make these points midpoints, then no matter how we draw this, this line is always the peak of this spline. And that is incredibly useful for drawing. Um, good neck profile shapes, being able to dimension to the tangency of a spline, which is actually not an available option. So let's delete this line for a second and I can show you exactly what I mean. So let's say we wanted to dimension to the tangency of the spline. Right now we can't really do that because I can draw a line here and if I select these two, there is no um, tangent option available. So I can't make that snap to it. Now I can make points snap to that spline. And so I could, in theory, you know, draw this down to like the midpoint here and dimension upwards. But there's no guarantee, as you can see here, that we dimension to the actual highest peak of that. So by understanding how these work, we can dimension to the tangency of our splines. So now you can see we can do that. So now let's dimension this as like 0.6 inches. And it went a little haywire on us. Let's bring it back. And let's make this like 1.75. So something fairly close to like the first fret of our neck. And then we can decide, do we want this to be asymmetric? Or do we want it to be symmetric? Now symmetric is easy because we can either just create a construction line that connects to the midpoint and make it vertical. Or what we can do is draw our point in the center here and make these two vertical. And that will fully define our quadratic Bezier curve or single point control point spline um, with just a height dimension and a width dimension. And if we didn't want it symmetric, then what we could do is draw a construction line from this point to this point here. And then we could define like an angle. So if I go like 60 degrees, then the peak of this arc will be at, six, at 60 degrees from the baseline. And so that's a really interesting way to be able to generate these shapes. Now you'll notice that because of the way a quadratic Bezier curve works, we are not going to end up being tangent to something that comes down. So if we imagine that we have our fretboard, so let's bring this up. 
let's say our fretboard is like this. And let's give this 0.25. So this will represent our fretboard. There we go. And so it's not coming tangent to that. And so that's one limiting factor of a quadratic Bezier curve is that it's a triangular shape or it's based off a triangular polygon. And so you can't have this come down tangent with this line. But that's where cubic Bezier curves really start to shine. So let's switch over to cubic Bezier curves. So if I create a spline and I do control point spline, a cubic Bezier curve just means that we have more than one control point. And every control point that you add more than one increases the order of the Bezier curve. And so if I can just hit the check mark here. And let's add a few dimensions to make this a little more constrained. So we're going to add a construction line, make it horizontal, and let's make these horizontal as well. Let's just define the dimension here because we need to know where this is in space right now. So like 0.75 inches. Okay, and now what we can do is determine, let's turn that off. Now we can determine, okay, what do we want that overall shape to look like? And let's draw our fretboard again. Obviously a rough representation of it. Make that vertical, and we'll make these collinear. There we go. So there's our fretboard again. And so now we just need to know what is the width. So we could say our width is 1.75 inches again. And then if we want this to come tangent to this line right here, then all we need to do is make this line collinear with this one. So we can just say collinear. Or we could just make it vertical if that's how the shape is drawn. And so we could say we want this one and this one to be collinear. And so now you can see I can get a sort of asymmetric shape. Or if these two are equal, then I can get a symmetrical shape. So let's make those equal for the time being. And let's dimension this to the same height as this one over here. So every single line that connects a control point, you have to connect these lines to, like you see over here. So if I draw from the midpoint to the midpoint here, to the midpoint here, now I have two more that can still be connected. And if I connect those two, you will notice that once again, we can dimension to the tangency of this spline. So now all I have to do is dimension this as, let's say, 0.75. Or if we want to make it the same height as this one, we'll go 0.6. And so we're able to get more of a C shape that actually comes down tangent to our fretboard. And now if you wanted to make this asymmetric, you could make this not um, equal, these two not equal. So let's delete this real quick. But you'll notice what happens is when these two aren't equal, then this line right here is no longer at the peak of this spline. So that creates a bit of a problem for us because if we want a symmetric sh an asymmetric shape, but we want to be able to, to dimension to the height of this spline, then actually what we need to do is add in an additional control point. So let's go back and let's make these two equal. Let's bring this up and let's delete these. So you can right click the spline and say insert, insert spline control point. And if I hover over that spline, it's going to give you a preview. So I'd have one, two, three. So let's do that. And so now we have three. And if I did it again, you could see I could divide it by four, five, six, etc. But if we leave it with three, then what we can do is we can make these equal. So that way we can dimension to the top. But then we can use this point to give us our asymmetric profile. So let's do that. So let's make these equal, and let's draw a line between here and here. And now since we have another one, we have to connect here to here, keep going around. And now we can connect the midpoints of each one of those. So here to here, like that. 
and then we can connect one more. And you'll notice once again, we're able to dimension to the tangency of this line. So we can dimension this as 0.65 or 0.6 to match the other one. And so now you'll notice that these can move up and down. So let's make these vertical. And so all we need to do is define this and define these heights. So what I would recommend doing, at least in the context of neck profiles, is just making this point horizontal to our tangency line. So we'll go horizontal. And so all we need to do now is just drag this over to create our asymmetric profile. So once again, we can add a point to that midpoint here, which is the highest point of our spline. And we have a couple of options here. So we can either draw an angle like we did before, which will end up fully defining that. So we can go, say, 60 degrees. In fact, let's make it a little less than that, 65. And we can get a pretty nice asymmetric shape. Or maybe what we care about more is that the distance that the highest point of our neck profile is offset from the center is 0.25. So we could do that too. So we could say that the highest point of this spline is off center by 0.25 from here. And that could be a really useful way to dimension that as well. You could also, if you want to, although this is less relevant, is define any one of these dimensions and it will do the same thing. So you could define these as well and you'll achieve the same result. So that is a really interesting way to be able to completely define and constrain control point splines in Fusion 360, whereas before we didn't really have access to do that. So effectively what we've done is we've recreated the underlying math that happens that generates this spline, which gives us access to much better ways of defining these with dimensions that are actually relevant to our design. So let's switch over and here I have a parametric fretboard sketch that I've created that I can come in here and change the scale length. Um, oh, I typed that wrong. 26 inch scale length, 24.75, whatever, and it will automatically adjust this for me. Now, let's go ahead and create a neck profile at the start and somewhere at the end. So what we can do is we can basically create planes at each one of our frets that we care about having a defined neck profile at. So in this case, I'm just going to do the start and not the end. We'll create one down here. So let's sketch on this plane. And let's project in that line at the bottom. So that way we can generate a closed profile. And let's create a cubic control point spline. So let's draw up here like this and down. Once we click that, we'll hit the check mark, which will close it. You never want to hit escape when you're drawing a control point spline. So if I click here like this, and then I'm like, okay, good, hit escape. Well, all of a sudden, what will happen is it deletes it, and you're like, what happened? So Make sure you hit the check mark. So we're going to draw this, this, here, check mark. And we know that we want it to come tangent to our fretboard. So let's project that in right here. And let's make these collinear. Make that collinear. Let's look at it from this angle. And so now we can make these equal, remember. And we can, if we want a C shape, then all we need to do is connect these three points like that. Draw from the midpoint here to here. Let's make these construction lines. And now we can just define the height of our neck at the end of our fretboard. So let's do 0.6. And we can get a generic C shape. Hit OK. That one is already done. And it's tangent. To this surface right here. So let's add another one. So this is the 12th fret. So let's add it at like the 15th fret, for example. Let's create a plane at angle. 
and we'll do 90 degrees. And let's make sure we're showing our plane so we can actually see it. And let's sketch on that plane. And let's project in that line to do the same thing we did before. And we can project in this surface using intersect. So we'll go create, project include, intersect. And that will generate the vertical line of this face where it intersects this plane. And we can use that to constrain our um, control point guides. So then we'll go spline, control point spline. And we'll do the same thing like that. See, I just hit escape there. <laughs> you never want to do that. It can be really irritating. Like that. Click and hit the check mark. And now let's make these collinear. And let's make sure we follow the same rules that we did on this one. So we'll make these collinear and we'll make these equal. And then let's go ahead and draw our construction lines. So from here to here, here to here, connect those two. And now we can just dimension the height here. And we'll make that like 0.75 inches. So now if you look at it this way, now they're not a perfect offset of each other, and that's by design. And I'll show you why in just a second. In fact, actually, let's just do that now. So if I project in this line, and let's hide that other sketch, and let's hide our fretboard here. Uh, there we go. Let's say instead of doing that, I just offset this line. What would happen? Well, you'd get pretty close. But the problem is, is your shape starts to change drastically as you get narrower and wider. So watch what happens as I get narrower. I start to lose my tangency and everything starts to deform a bit. And if I drag it too big, it turns it much more into a straight radius, which we don't want. So instead of projecting in the other one and just offsetting it, we're generating a new control point spline that follows the same um, rules, but at a different height. And so that way what we can do now is just loft between these two. So solid, loft, and hit OK. So let's hide the sketch and let's take a look at this. In fact, let's change our material type here because that's very dark. Let's make these a bit brighter. Now right now these are um, basically one body, unfortunately, because I didn't add it as a new component. That would have been smart. But that's okay. So let's take a look at like our curvature. So let's go inspect zebra analysis. And you can see there is a slight deformity here, but that's only because this is G1, not G2 curvature. And I can show you how to do that in a moment but you get a pretty nice transition from one side to the other. So let's actually go ahead and talk about how to make this G2 curvature so we get a perfect transition to our fretboard. So if we go back to, let's do the first sketch. So what we can do is we need to add two more control points. And what that'll effectively do is every control point that is collinear with this line right here adds to the G value, let's say. So G1, G2, G3 curvature. So let's delete these real, real quick. And let's add a control point. And here, and we're gonna do it again. And then what we can do is make these either collinear, which will achieve the same thing. Or what we can do is just say we want this spline and this line right here to be curvature. And you'll notice it automatically snapped this point to being collinear with this one. And so we can say this line right here and this right here, we want to be curvature. And then basically we can just redo the same thing. But what I would recommend doing, because the control points or the control lines have to connect between all of these. So I would do that first. So connect these points here like this. We'll just go around, keep going. There's gonna be a lot of them in this case because we have so many. Like that, 
keep going. This ends up being a lot, I apologize. But let's make these all construction lines. And now let's make this um, curvature. So we'll do that, and we'll make this one curvature to here. And let's make sure we drag this up so we can see it better. And we need to make sure that these points right here are equal or horizontal to each other. And we can make sure this one's horizontal. And now we basically have access like we did before. So let's make these ones horizontal to here. So that way it's in line with that. And then we can define the height. So let's define the height here. Like that as point six, and you know maybe that is a little too squished so let's delete that horizontal and let's just make these two line segments here equal to each other and that will fully define it for us and that gives us a little bit better result but now we are actually G2 curvature down to this surface so that's kind of a pain in the butt to get G2, and you really don't need it for woodworking. But if you really cared about getting a perfect transition into there, you could do that. And if you're really a glutton for punishment, then you can add another two, one to each top of these, do the same thing, kind of make these all equal, and draw all of, draw all of your lines, and you could end up with a G3 Class A surface um, transition between your fretboard and your neck. So I'm going to actually just undo this and go back to where we were before. And let's go ahead and talk about how to make an asymmetric neck profile. So just like we did in the example earlier, we're going to add one control point spline, or a control point to this spline. And we're going to follow the exact same rules that we did in the example. So connect these like that. And we'll do another one. I hit escape. Like this and then connect these two as well let's make these construction lines and let's make these horizontal so now we can define this and we can define it like that so let's make these collinear and so now we should be able to just define our height and how asymmetric is it so let's define our height here as 0.6 and how do we how asymmetric do we want this to be so let's go ahead and do the offset method where I add a point here in the middle and we're going to define that as being 0.25 off of center or let's do 0.375 see that went a little too far because now our spline is going to breach past this line a little bit so yeah, let's just leave it at 0.25 and hit OK. And now you'll notice that our fretboard, or not our fretboard, our neck has updated to an asymmetric type profile where we have this shape on the front side of the fretboard or neck and a C shape on the rear. And that might be really useful if you're going to a guitar body that has a more symmetric heel shape. So you could have a symmetric shape at the heel, but an asymmetric shape at the headstock. Or we could change this one to be asymmetric as well if you're designing this from scratch and you control the heel shape. So let's change this one as well to being asymmetric, following the same rules. So let's add a control point here, and let's make these equal and collinear to this line and this one collinear to that line and let's draw our lines like that and connect them all midpoint to midpoint okay once again let's make all these construction lines and let's define our height as 0.75 inches and we need to define uh, the height of these and how asymmetric is it so let's make these horizontal like we did with the other one and how far offset 
So on this other one, we went in this direction. So in this one, let's go the opposite direction. Now it is important probably to pay attention to how far you're making this offset because you probably don't want this arc to breach in past the highest point of your um, one up above because then what you'll end up doing is having a point at the back of your neck that is actually shorter than the point at the front of the neck. So what we can do is just make sure that our offset is, stays just either outside or tangent to that line. So let's add our point here. So let's add our point at the midpoint. And let's dimension that as 0.125. And let's check. Are we OK? Yes, we are. So let's hit OK, finish, and our neck has now updated. So now we have a, let's look at it from this angle. We have an asymmetric going in this direction on this side and an asymmetric going in the opposite direction on that side. But just like in many of my headstock transition videos, it is quite useful to have these split, this face split into two surfaces so you can control the continuity when you're patching or lofting to your headstock or your heel transition. So let's go ahead and switch over to the surface tab and let's delete these front and rear faces like that and let's split this body across the height of our splines. So what we can do is we can go plane through three points and let's bring these sketches back and so we're going to say we're going to go from here to here to the top of this one and so that's going to give us our angled um, plane that we can split this and hit OK. And then we will go modify split face and we'll split this top face with this plane. Hit OK and hide the planes. And so now what you'll see is we have our face of our neck split exactly at the highest point of our spline. So that way when we're drawing to our headstock and trying to create our like volute or headstock transition or trying to define um, our heel transition, we actually have the proper geometry that we need to go ahead and constrain and define it. So the main reason I have historically avoided splines is because they are notoriously difficult to constrain and make parametric infusion. But if we recreate the underlying geometry that defines their shape, we can give them dimensions that are more relevant to our design, making them easier to understand and allowing us to generate more interesting and comfortable neck profiles. Armed with a cursory understanding of Bezier curves, I'm now convinced that not all splines are overrated. If you'd like to support my channel or download models featured in each of my videos, you can find me at patreon.com forward slash Austin Shaner. If you'd like to submit a request for this channel, receive help from myself or other viewers on a design that you're working on, or simply join a community where we share ideas and push the boundaries of what Fusion is capable of, you can join our Discord server. Links will be in the description below. Thank you all for coming. This is Austin, signing out.